McCarthy to the governor in Wisconsin and to Andy McCarthy. Um, is this common where they where the defendant draws numbers from a tumbler to decide who debates his fate and who does not? Well, Bill, it's certainly it's apparently it this is the Wisconsin. I'm Go sorry. ahead, Andy. Yeah, this is the Wisconsin practice. So to compare in federal court, what would happen would be if you took 18, which you don't do in every case, but in a longer case or where you're afraid of losing jurors, um, if you take 18, if during the trial you lose one of the 12, the, the first 12 who are picked are deemed to be the jury in the last six of the alternates. And then if you lose a juror during the trial, the alternates replace the jurors as you know, from the lowest number to the highest number, the first one picked to the last one picked. I, um, I get all that. The reason it's just keep... the, the process yeah. is, it just seems very unique, Andy. Yeah, but understand, Rittenhouse doesn't know who he's picking. You know, they put those names in the tumbler. He's picking out numbers. The numbers, in, you know, don't relate as far as he's concerned to, like, named jurors. So it's like the lottery. He doesn't really know which six are coming out. Governor Walker, you were going to say something? Yeah, I've actually been on a jury trial before, not in a criminal case, but in a civil case. I was the uh, 13th juror at the end when they went to deliberation. Both attorneys agreed to, to take me off, so I didn't ultimately make the decision. Uh, but it's not necessarily the practice uh, on cases like that. So I think a lot of people found that interesting. The, the other thing to remember is some people have made a big deal about this judge and made some comments about him. He was appointed in 1983 when I was in school by a Democrat governor by the name of Tony Earle. He comes from Kenosha County, which is a, a blue collar, but typically Democrat county. And, and uh, I, as I mentioned before, I think the bottom line, you got to remember, people there understood what happened last year. And so when that uh, attorney, the prosecutor, pointed the gun at the jury, which was unconventional, I think a lot of people, that might backfire. A lot of those people remember what things were like last year and how they might have reacted and un under those tragic and unfortunate yeah, circumstances. We'll that plays so, John, if we're watching the, the courtroom now, or the, if the judge is, is back, let's listen in. In a similar situation, and the extra jurors were, all they had to watch was daytime TV, and I'm afraid I can't even arrange that for you. Um, but um, I don't know, maybe there was something about some movies or something, wasn't there? I hope, yeah. I hope they appeal to everyone. Becky's gone this morning. Um, well, anyway, uh, we'll see what we can do to uh, give you some kind of uh, uh, entertainment. And uh, but in the meantime, please uh, adhere to those rules, and uh, um, you will be. We're not going to sequester anybody or anything at this particular point. So, um, uh, and I hope that they have a comfortable place arranged. I understand they do. So, uh, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Are we allowed to get our belongings? Yes. I, in fact, I'm having the bailiff escort you up there now. And while you're there, you're not to have any conversation with the other jurors, OK? Anything else? OK, fine. Thank you very much. And give those to the jurors, yes. So there's the answer again on sequestration. It will not happen. And Andy McCarthy was expressing concerns a moment ago on that. Jonna, do you have similar concerns if the jurors, if they don't reach a verdict today or tomorrow, they're going home every night, the possibility of being exposed to what's happening on the outside? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's a little too little, a little too late at this point to, eat, to really else, consider no, it, unless for some reason the deliberations went on exceedingly long. But uh, I think what we're seeing now is the unglamorous life of an alternate. You know, now they get to sit and twiddle their thumbs. They don't get to deliberate. They don't get to do anything. They can't even watch regular TV. And, uh, and, and now it begins. John, what is it like today for Kyle Rittenhouse as he sits and waits? <clears throat> you know, he's an 18-year-old kid. This happened when he was 17. He has been, you know, he is one juror away from spending uh, life in prison, potentially. Uh, and, and it's got to be incredibly nerve wracking. It's also, you know, he in, in a sense, he's a little bit of an icon for those of us who believe that he did mount a very good self-defense defense, defense 
Uh, I was listening to Tucker last night. Dana Lash said self-defense is on trial here. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I also think it's very interesting. You know, we all learned a little bit about the prosecution's case here. And I was really struck on how much he, I think, potentially confused these jurors, how wrong he was on the law, how he tried to say that, oh, you know, a dumpster fire is just a little dumpster fire when arson is never peaceful. Arson should never be, you know, simply swept under the rug like it's just a little minor inconvenience. And the way he portrayed what was happening in Kenosha, I think, is is really uh, disheartening and horrible. Well, just on those points there, Andy, everybody's right right now because we don't have an answer on this, so every opinion matters. Uh, there was some criticism directed toward the judge. A lot of people felt that he was pro-defense. Uh, a lot of people have um, uh, lashed out at the prosecutor saying that he's lost in this case. I, do you concur with either A or B? And if so, where does that lead you in your own legal logic now? picture of Judge Schroeder, because what we got to see was he get very angry at prosecutors who really did things that would get any judge angry, to, to go on the third rail of commenting on a defendant's uh, <clears throat> Fifth Amendment privilege on staying silent, to comment on things that had been ruled uh, against the prosecution and to bring them up anyway without the court's permission. Any judge would get upset about that. And what I thought was not being included in the, in the picture of the judge was the fact that he could have thrown the prosecution's case out when the state rested, and he didn't. Um, he waited till the last second to throw out that misdemeanor possession count, and he never threw it out on grounds that I thought he could have thrown it out on from the beginning, which is that it was an unconstitutionally vague charge. Uh, it wasn't until they actually were able to measure the gun and see that it didn't meet the statutory requirement that he finally said, okay, it's out of the case. But what I'm saying is he left charges in the case that give the prosecution a chance to win a case that they should lose. So I don't think he's a pro-defense judge, and I don't think he's a pro-government judge. I think he's a judge. This is a, not an easy case. He's doing the best he can. I don't agree with everything he's done. I think he should have given... I, you know, the prosecutors made some very wild legal arguments in the summation. I was very surprised the defense didn't get up and object to them, and I'm surprised the judge, you know, didn't stop the prosecutor and tell the jury, you know, clarity on what the law is. Governor, um, tell me about Kenosha and the community. has been obviously through a lot uh, in this last year. And the fact that they have 500 National Guard troops on standby today might ha have them on edge. But... But as a town, a community, your experience there? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a, a tough town. It's gone through a lot over the decades. The AMC and Chrysler plants were there and closed down. It's a very blue-collar area, traditionally <laughs> Democrat, but kind of that blue dog Democrat. And uh, of all the places you could have seen riots, it was most shocking in Kenosha, most frustrating, because I think a lot of people felt like uh, people rioted, many from outside of the area, well before before they knew all the facts. Uh, I mentioned last year, not only Tony Evers, the Democrat governor, but even Joe Biden's comments. Uh, the Kenosha News, which traditionally endorses Democrats in most big races, uh, came out with an editorial criticizing the Democrat governor and, in a way, indirectly, uh, Joe Biden for just pouring fuel on the flames last year. They were very frustrated with what happened in an otherwise pretty quiet, pretty tame, pretty blue-collar community. Thanks to all three of you. Stand by, as the judge said a moment ago, Andy McCarthy and Jonas Spielborn and Governor Scott Walker. Uh, thank you very much to all three of you. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Kilmeade. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to click to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page. This is the only way that I know for sure that you're not going to miss any great commentary, any great news bites, any great interviews coming your way on Fox. You can get it all here on YouTube. So subscribe right now.